The terrifying Hellraiser saga surrounding Pinhead and his nefarious band of Cenobites continues in Hellraiser Judgment, with more puzzle boxes, hapless victims, and of course, a few trips to 55 Lodovico Place. This time, there's a serial slayer on the loose in the earthly realm, doling out justice for various violations of the Ten Commandments as some sort of sick scheme to win God's favor. Meanwhile, Pinhead and his pals have been exacting their own brand of justice in Hell. And when the two worlds collide, well, there's you know what to pay. Evil seeks evil. Let's take a look at how the story draws everything together and sets up the next round of Hellraising. Harsh Judgment. Pinhead's new right hand man, er, thing, is the most interesting addition to the film. Called the Auditor, this slashed faced baddie begins the process of eternal judgment on Pinhead's behalf. I am a man for whom pain is nothing more than a common currency. Naturally, this is all very gross for everyone involved. After the auditor types up a human's confession, another sidekick called the Assessor chows down on the pages and regurgitates them up for a trio of jurors, who rifle through the contents and then render their verdict. Punishment then begins with a disgusting saliva bath before the subject is sent to the butcher and the surgeon for some key rearrangements. So yeah, it's foul in every imaginable way. And whoever ends up at the Cotton House is in for quite an unpleasant surprise, unless… Detective with a dark side. At first, we're led to believe that Detective Sean Carter is just a man who's far too into his job of hunting down serial killers. He comes home late to his angry wife, can't seem to stay away from work, and is even being investigated by the case's newest pair of eyes. Detective Christine Edgerton is here to help, but she also believes he might be suffering from PTSD from his war service and maybe dabbling in drugs or alcohol. His brother David, who is somehow his partner in crime fighting, thinks he's a rational and good person and gladly follows him down whatever rabbit hole his investigations take him through. By the end of the film, however, we find out that looks have been very deceiving when it comes to Sean. It is a terrible, ponderous chain you are making. He's actually the one who's taken on the mantle of righteous death dealer, slaughtering people who run afoul of the Ten Commandments in pretty much any way, shape, or form. Between him underlining the same Charles Dickens quotes from the crime scenes to his obsession with Ecclesiastes, which roughly translates to the very name of the man thereafter, he implicates himself pretty well along the way. What was it he said? Only God can judge me. God will judge the righteous and his crimes are unspeakable. He saws off the hands, eyeballs, and teeth of some teens while they're still alive, simply because they'd committed petty theft. He surgically implants a woman's womb with her still-living dog because she says in a phone video that she worships the animal. It's so bad that even the assessor can't stomach the taste of his confessions. And yet, he manages to escape judgment, twice, because of a demand from on high. The powers that be. It seems like Pinhead holds the ultimate authority over how guilty people are treated in his domain. But when the Archangel Jophiel shows up and insists that David be sent back to Earth to finish his work, which at first we think is just solid policing, Pinhead's team has no choice but to concede. Well, do you understand who is in charge? So let him go. Pinhead still sends his Stitch twins along to haunt his nightmares, but he mostly steers clear of Sean. After Sean brings himself back to Pinhead's realm again, though, in the hopes of trading his brother and wife for his own soul being cleared, Pinhead and his auditor refuse to bargain with him or Jophiel. They're ready to move on to the punishment phase. And chaining Sean's brother and wife up to a state of eternal suffering won't satisfy their bloodlust. Jophiel wants him to be sent back to Earth to carry on with his commandment slaughters so more people will turn to the Almighty for protection. This makes Sean believe his plan is falling into place. But Jophiel informs him that he's not getting any absolution out of this arrangement. He'll still be Penhead's property after it's all said and done, but she just wants to buy him more time for his bad deeding. The trouble is, Penhead's grown wary of blindly obeying Jophiel's demands. The Final Judgment At first, Penhead obliges Jophiel's request to return Sean to the living so he can score the good side some souls. But when Sean regains consciousness, he's immediately waxed by Detective Edgerton, who's now figured out he's the big bad they've been looking for. Sean's instant demise puts him back in Pinhead's clutches, for good this time. And that angers Jophiel, who threatens to bring down the wrath of her boss for his insolence. Pinhead decides he's got nothing to lose, though. He's already in hell and was basically built to endure such suffering. So how much worse could it get for him? Not only does he ignore her warnings, 
Pinhead also proceeds to throw the angel into his chains and lets them rip her to shreds. Even the auditor knows his boss has made a massive mistake. As he points out, Jophiel was the angel who banished Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, and if she could do it to them, she could do something similar to Pinhead. Just as all of those he's judged have awoken to the harsh consequences of their mistakes, the last scene finds a humanized version of Pinhead banished from his realm of sweet suffering and sent to the mortal realm. Meanwhile, the post credit scene opens the door for the auditor to take over altogether, as he's shown in Hanover, Germany, welcoming two unsuspecting missionaries into his lethal lair. Two. And it is indeed on a Tuesday. Thanks for watching. Click the looper icon to subscribe to our YouTube channel, plus check out all this cool stuff we know you'll love too.